bit of a history lesson and put together two ideas we've already covered, circular motion and gravity. <clears throat> All right, so the ancient astronomers believed that the Earth was the center of the universe and then the water was around that, the air and the fire, that all the th five, four elements had their natural place. And the heavens were um, composed of the stars and the planets. And then way out here was the, the fixed background of stars, which is called the firmament. firmament. Um, and, and basically they believe that these spheres rotated around the earth, and that's why the sun came up and the sun went down. And the planets were on different spheres that rotated at different rates. And then out on the very back here was the firmament, or the fixed sphere, that rotated at a constant rate. So this worked pretty well, explaining uh, what was going on in the heavens, but there were a couple of problems. And the most notable problem was what is called the retrograde motion of the planets. And so um, if you watch here in this video, you'll see something interesting happen. You have Mars right here moving like it's on a sphere, there goes Ver Venus and Mercury, they just pass it. But then you notice Mercury right here just moved backwards and then went forward again. So that's called the retrograde grade motion of the planets. Some of the planets seem to move backwards at, at certain instances. And that couldn't be explained by any um, way to think about these spheres being rotated in one direction um, by the hand of God, for example. Did God stop the spheres and back them up for a minute? So that was... Pretty confusing. Um, so there were other problems with that. So through the Middle Ages, not a whole lot happened in the realm of science. But uh, at the beginning of the Enlightenment, um, the uh, the scientists start studying and publishing what they thought and saw. And a guy by the name of Copernicus spent his lifetime carefully observing and making measurements. And he published the first heliocentric theory. So heliocentric means the sun is the center of our universe. And it sort of looked like this. Um, hang on one second, I'm gonna, there we go, go back to full screen. Um, it, it looked like this, he proposed that the sun was the center of the universe and that all the planets went around the sun, including Earth, which is right here, terra firma, and around the Earth went the moon. Um, and it seemed to make sense because if you think about the Earth going around this track and Mars going around this track, since we are going on a, on a faster track at a smaller radius, for a moment there, it looks like we are passing Mars and Mars is moving backwards. So imagine you're running on a track and somebody in the outer lane, you might be passing them on the inner lane. Um, and for a moment, it appears that they are moving backwards relative to you. So Copernicus' model was pretty well received. Didn't get a whole lot of pushback. Then the next guy in our story is a guy named Tycho Brahe. He's very rich. His uncle owns an island. And uh, he built the first known observatory that was dedicated to measuring the location of planets. So get this. For 20 years, every night that it wasn't cloudy, he mapped over 1,000 stars and every planet, their locations, all through the night. So he had this vast treasure trove of data, and it was very carefully um, measured and recorded. He got in trouble later on with his uncle. They had a feud. He got kicked out of um, Denmark. He ended up traveling to Prague, where he was joined by a young guy by the name of Kepler. And the important thing in this story is that he brought all his data with him. So Kepler is a uh, prodigy. He's a brilliant mathematician. And he is interested in astronomy, which at the time didn't seem to make any sense. I mean, if God controlled the heavens and rotated the spheres, why would you care about mathematics if you're trying to figure out what God is doing up there with the spheres? But uh, he was trying to apply his mathematics to astronomy. But he had a problem when he was small. He had smallpox, and it left him with really poor vision and crippled hands. And if you're going to be an astronomer, uh, you've got to have some good vision. Either that, or you've got to have some really good data. So it turns out he hooks up with this Brahe who gets kicked out of Denmark, and Kepler has access to all this data. Um, Brahe eventually dies, and Kepler continues to pour through the data um, to formulate an understanding of what's going on with the solar system. And his work verified the heliocentric model, the idea that the sun is the center of the universe. It explained every single thing that we could observe, observe with the planets and their motions. Um, and he, uh, he was actually able to do things like calculate the radii of the orbits and the periods of the orbits, how long it took each planet to go around the sun. His cru crucial contribution, contributions came in 1609, so um, this is definitely um, the beginning of the, of the um, Renaissance or the Enlightenment. Some people 
actually pegged the beginning of the Renaissance with Kepler's um, publication of his three laws because they were empirical, they were based on evidence, and they attempted to explain the universe based on evidence, not based on theology or any other um, philosophy. So here's Kepler's three laws. You don't need to know them. You just got to be aware of them and sort of understand the idea. The first thing he discovered was that all of the orbits of the planets around the sun are elliptical. They're not pure circles. They're slightly eccentric or um, slightly uh, para, I mean, uh, elliptical. And um, some of them have small eccentricity. So like Earth, it's pretty close to round. And some of them have very large eccentricities like Halley's Comet that move very far from the sun and then very close. Okay. The second thing he noticed was that when the planets are far from the sun, they're moving slower, and when they're close to the sun, they move faster. Now, we can think about that in terms of energy. When this uh, comet, for example, is far from the sun, it has a lot of potential energy relative to the sun, but it has very little kinetic energy. It's moving slowly. And then here, the sun pulls on it and accelerates it, and when it gets here, it has lots of kinetic energy, but not so much potential energy. So remember, the potential energy has to do with how far you are from the sun. The farther you are from the sun, the um, more potential energy you have relative to the sun. And so um, that makes sense. What he actually discovered, though, was that if you think about how far the planet moves in one period of time, so um, imagine this is Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet takes 76 years to go all the way around. So imagine that every 7.6 years, you figure out how far Halley's Comet went. So when it's far from the sun, it's moving slow. And when it gets close to the sun, it's moving fast. What he noticed, though, is that the areas that are swept out in equal intervals of time for each of the planets and everything that orbited the sun, those areas were all equal. So this area right here is equal to this area right here. So the farther you are from the sun, the slower it moved, but the total area swept out in a unit of time was equal. Okay, that was Kepler's second law. Kepler's third law was basically what you guys did in the lab activity to start the lesson. He figured out that, and we didn't quite plot this, but he figured out that if you take the radius of the orbit, which is sometimes called the semi-major axis, and you cube it, it is directly proportional to the square of the orbital period. Okay, So Kepler figured that out. Now, Kepler could not observe any of these planets here, so we're just talking from Saturn down to Mercury. But for all of those planets, he observed that they fit absolutely on a perfect straight line when you plot the radius of the orbit cubed on one axis and the square of the period on the other axis. Now you did this in lab and actually you got the orbital period on the y-axis and so what you had to do on the x-axis was take the orbital radius um, cubed and then the square root or to the three halves power. So if you were to square both the axes you would still have a straight line and you would have the orbital period squared and the orbital radius cubed and that's what he found. Okay, so that was Kepler's three laws. Quick detour, Galileo was an interesting guy. He uh, challenged the views of Aristotle that the heavens were perfect, and he basically got himself in trouble with the church. He wasn't very content to quietly publish science. He was a bit of an apologist, and he wanted to um, ruffle some feathers. So he got himself in trouble. But he did do some cool things. He used the newly invented telescope. He actually didn't invent it. It was invented by the Dutch about 30 years before. But I'm not sure what the Dutch were doing with it, but he pointed it at the sky, and he discovered spots on the sun. He discovered craters on the moon. He discovered that um, Jupiter has four moons going around it, which we now call the Galilean moons. And he discovered the Milky Way. So these were all an affront to the current theology, which said that the heavens were perfect. So if the heavens are perfect, how can there be spots on the sun? How can the moon have all kinds of craters and pockmarks in it? That doesn't go with the theology of the perfect heavens. So he was prosecuted by the church for his views. And he's pretty much remembered as sort of a martyr for science. Um, although he did have some fairly significant contributions. All right, so back to Newton. So Newton had this idea um, that forces attract everything towards the Earth. So an apple falls because of the force of gravity pulling on it. What bothered Newton, though, wasn't the apple. He knew apples fell. That wasn't a new thing. That wasn't surprising. What really bothered Newton was the fact that the moon up there wasn't falling. How is it possible to explain the moon not falling? That's what bothered Newton. So, why did the moon not fall? That was his question. So, here's a little simulation to kind of think of what's going on. 
So this is a thought experiment that Newton did, and this is actually the diagram he drew in his notebook. Um, on top of it has been superimposed a um, HTML applet. But the idea is if you take a cannon and you put it on a really tall hill and you fire the cannon, the ball travels in this path, the ball falls. Now, what if I up the speed of the cannon? Now the cannonball goes there. And I think you would agree the cannonball is still falling. By falling, we mean it is attracted towards the Earth and it is following a parabolic path. So if we keep adding dynamite or gunpowder to our cannon, we can fire it really fast and it falls a really long way because as it falls, the Earth curves and so it really went a long way. So here's the insight that Newton had. What if you fire it fast enough so that the, the cannonball travels around the Earth and falls the entire time, but as it is falling, the Earth is curving. He realized that circular motion, orbital motion around the Earth um, is consistent with the idea that that object is falling. This object was falling the entire time it was in motion. It's just that it was going a very special speed and it fell at the exact same rate the Earth curved, okay? So that was Newton's insight. The moon is traveling around the Earth in a very special orbit, going just the right speed so that although gravity does pull on the moon, it's falling always at a special rate that causes it to circle the Earth instead of crash to the Earth, okay? And if you would have too much more gunpowder, there's another demonstration here, it'll actually just sort of leave. So it'll get bigger and bigger. So that's the idea. Um, there's just a special speed that makes that happen. Okay, so that was what we call Newton's canon, and that was a thought experiment that Newton did. He didn't actually do the experiment, obviously. All right, so Newton's conclusion is that the moon is not different from the apple. It is falling, but it's falling at the exact same rate that the Earth is curving. Because of its sideways or horizontal or tangential velocity, it moves in a circle, always falling but never reaching the ground. Now, a quick comment on weightlessness. Remember, weightlessness is what you feel when there's no force pushing back on you. If you climb in an elevator and they cut the cables, you will feel weightless for a while. Not because there's no gravity, but because there's no normal force pushing back on you. And so, things that are falling are weightless. It doesn't mean there's no gravity force. It just means there's no normal force pushing back on you. So, a fun fact is this airplane is used to film weightless scenes. So when you watch a film and there's a scene where somebody's floating around in a weightless environment, they're usually on this plane. It climbs really high and then it dives towards the earth and while it's falling for about 30 seconds, everybody on the plane is weightless and they can film the scene. And then it turns around and goes back up high in the sky. When you turn around, your stomach kind of lurches like on the roller coaster. And so sometimes this thing is called the vomit comet because everybody throws up after it turns around and climbs again. But for 30 seconds at a time, you can film weightlessness because you are falling. All right, so here's what Newton understood. He understood circular motion is caused by a force that acts perpendicular to the velocity and the magnitude of the force is mv squared over r, where m is the mass of the thing moving in a circle. Okay, so I think you guys understand that too from our previous lesson. What Newton postulated was that gravity is responsible for this circular motion. And gravity, he thought, looked like this. He thought it was g, m1, m2, so the product of the masses, and then he thought that gravity was diluted by r squared. He couldn't test this, but this is what he thought. So he wondered what would happen if he um, attributed the circular motion, the force making the moon move in a circle, to gravity. What would happen? So he realized that gravity could be the mechanism that explains the orbits of the planet. You don't need the hand of God. You've got gravity pulling on it. Gravity can provide the centripetal force that keeps the planets and the moons in orbit. So the big idea that Newton realized is that the centripetal force could be caused by gravity. Gravity could be the centripetal force. Now remember, he's not sure of gravity yet. He needs some evidence to confirm that. But he thinks that's the way it should be. So let's do an experiment. Let's think about what would happen if we had a large central mass and a little mass m rotating around the central mass, okay? We are going to define capital T as the period, which is the time it takes this guy to go all the way around. And we're going to be really careful. Big M is the mass in the middle, and little m is the mass of the thing that's doing the orbiting, okay? It's the thing moving in a circle. So the force of uh, the centripetal force equals the gravity force Newton proposed.
That means that mv squared, the centripetal force, must equal gmm over r squared. And I think you realize the masses, the little masses, will cancel, and one of these r's will cancel. And that leaves us with this equation. The mass and that r cancels, you leave v squared equals gm over r. So first of all, Newton realized this tells him what velocity an object must be moving to move in a circle. If you know g, the universal gravitational constant, and you know the mass of the object in the middle, and you know the radius of the circle, you can figure out how fast the object must be moving to move in a circle there. Let's keep going. The velocity you go is the distance divided by the time. So remember, one lap around is a circumference, and that distance is 2 pi r. So the distance it goes is 2 pi r, and the time it takes we defined as the period. So the period right here, t, is the time it takes. So another way to express the velocity is the distance 2 pi r over t. We can plug this 2 pi r over t in here for the velocity. So see here we have velocity squared. So we're going to get 2 pi over t squared equals gm over r. I can go ahead and square everything here. I get 4 pi squared r squared over t squared equals gm over r. You can then cross multiply here to clean it up a little bit. And then I'm going to solve for t squared there. If I solve for t squared, it looks like this. I'm going to factor out the r cubed here out of the fraction and write it like this. And there we go. So this is what ought to happen if gravity is the mechanism responsible for circular motion, okay, for orbital motion. Now, he got this result. Remember, he's not sure gravity's right. He just thought gravity was right. But when he got this result, he knew gravity was right because this was a result he had seen before. Kepler had already showed that the orbital period squared is proportional to the orbital radius cubed. And that, or another way to write that is, the orbital period is proportional to the radius to the 3 halves power. Kepler had already found this. He found this by plotting the data he measured taken from Brahe. So this was not a theory. This was evidence. And his theory, his idea, actually lined up perfectly with what Kepler had already measured, the mathematical model Kepler had already found for the actual relationship between the orbital period and the orbital radius. And so that gave Newton confidence. So the idea is, um, hey, this law of gravity, maybe it's g m1 m2 over r squared. If that's true, that leads to a prediction. The prediction was that the period of the orbit squared should be proportional to the radius cubed. And that was confirmed by experimental evidence collected many years earlier by Kepler. That gave him confidence that the idea was valid. So many scientists after that went on to build and extend this idea of gravity, and they made more and more predictions. They made predictions about how long it should take the moons to orbit Jupiter. They made predictions about comets, and every single time they were confirmed. And so after many, many iterations of this process, this idea became a theory, and so we call it the theory of gravity. In science, the word theory doesn't mean, ah, it's a guess. In science, the word theory means it is a rock-solid, thoroughly tested explanation for the way something works. All right, so here's an example problem I'm going to do, um, and you can kind of pause it to slow it down because I'm going to kind of whip through it pretty fast, but um, I'm going to start by a, a simple example of small numbers. Imagine we've got a big, huge chunk of ice out in deep space. So think about it, a cube of ice the size of a school bus. It's 2.0 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. And there is a rock, one kilogram rock, so I don't know, like a softball. And if you just give it a nudge at the right speed, that rock will orbit the chunk of ice. Okay, so the question is, what speed do we need to give it and how long will it take to go around? All right, so we're going to answer five questions. The first question is, what is the force of gravity between the two objects? You guys know how to find the force of gravity. It's gmm over r squared. You can plug in all the numbers. It's 15 meters from the center of the ice ball. And you can work out that the force of gravity turns out to be basically 59 billionths of a newton. It's that tiny force. And so you can imagine this rock doesn't have a whole lot of force tugging on it, making it move in a circle. It's going to have to move pretty slow. So the second question, what is the centripetal force causing the rock to move in a circle? Well, that's a trick question. The idea is that the force of gravity is the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is the force of gravity, which is the same as our previous answer. Now, how fast can it be moving? So remember, 
the centripetal force equals mv squared over r. And since we know the centripetal force from the previous slide, and we know the mass of the rock, and we know the radius, we can solve for v. So I'm going to solve for v, and you can plug in the numbers. And it turns out it's moving about 0.94 millimeters every second. Okay, not very fast at all. It takes more than a minute to go a foot. Okay. All right, so now that we know the velocity, we can calculate how far it goes in one orbit. So this is the circumference. The circumference is 2 pi r, so that's the distance it goes. And so you plug that in, and that's 94 meters. So now we know the velocity. We know the distance. We want to figure out how long does it take the time. So remember, the distance equals the rate times the time. If you want to find the time, take the distance divided by the velocity. So we're going to take the distance it goes, which was 94 meters, divided by the velocity, and that tells us the time. It's about 1.0 times 10 to the fifth seconds, which turns out to be close to 28 hours. So it'll take 28 hours for this rock to circle a chunk of ice because the force of gravity is so tiny, it cannot be moving very fast. If you made it move faster than that, it would just fly off and leave. Okay. All right, here's a second example, which I'm going to solve algebraically. The space station is up there above the Earth. It has a mass of about 420,000 kilograms, and it's 254 miles above the surface of the Earth. This is called low Earth orbit. We know the mass of the Earth, um, and we know the radius of the Earth. So the question is, what is the orbital period of the International Space Station? That's what we're going to try to find. Okay? So we're going to do this algebraically. I'm going to call the mass in the middle big M. The space station is little m. The height of the space station above the Earth is 254 miles, which you can convert to meters. And so the radius of its orbit is the radius of the Earth plus its height above the Earth, which turns out to be 6.78 times 10 to the 6 meters. All right. So we're going to say algebraically the force of gravity equals the centripetal force. The force of gravity is gmm over r squared. That equals mv squared over r. Little m cancels. One of the r's cancels. We plug in for the velocity, the distance over time, which is 2 pi r, r over the period. We plug that in here and square everything, and we get this equation. We cross multiply, and we get this equation, and we are trying to find the period. So the period is going to be um, this mass divided by gm, and then the square root of it. You can then plug in your numbers, and it turns out to be 5,562 seconds, which is about 92.7 minutes. So the space station goes around the Earth every 92.7 minutes. That's the time it's got to take because it's got to take it's got to have just the right velocity so that it it's like a bullet, right? It's got to fall at the exact same rate the Earth is curving. Okay? So for this altitude, 256 miles above the Earth, it's got to have an orbital period of 92.7 minutes. Okay? And if you go back here and look at this relationship, if r gets bigger, t gets bigger. It takes longer. So the bigger and bigger the radius, the farther and farther it is from Earth, the more time it takes to orbit the Earth. Okay? All right. So you're going to use this idea to solve some problems. All right? So um, there's a problem set for you to work on next. Um, thanks for watching the video. Sorry it was kind of long, um, but uh, you'll be fine. So uh, go ahead and work on the problem set next, and um, you can email me if you have any questions. Okay.